I've been wanting to talk about JoJo's Bizarre Adventure so badly on this channel for so long, but every time I sit down and write up a script, I realize the series is just too big and massive to fit into one single video. Unless you guys want me to make like a 5 hour mega review of the whole series, but we'll save that for another day. Today we're going to be looking at one of the most iconic parts of one of the most iconic parts. Chapters 98 to 103 of the original Stardust Crusaders manga, Darby the Gambler. I told you my name is Darby, understand? Not Obi, not Barbie. Hmm? For those who may not be totally informed, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is a nine-part horror comedy thriller series following the different members of the Joestar family as they fight the supernatural forces of evil. Although it differs from part to part, each episode or bundle of chapters generally deals with a new threat, forcing the protagonists into difficult situations they must find their way out of. The Gambler Darby episodes are regarded as some of the highest points of the entire franchise due to just how well it embodies the spirit of the series. I mean, the encounter is completely defined by its classic serving of overcomplicated scientific plans and the insane pressure it puts on the protagonist. Part 3 gets its name from the Stardust Crusaders, a group of men seeking information on Dio, a vampire who has killed and manipulated thousands of innocent people. Ja -ja! Upon their arrival in Cairo, Egypt, they come across Darby, a gambler with the powers of the Egyptian god of death, Osiris. Before long, they're gambling for their souls, which have been turned into poker chips. The anime adaptation of this encounter is a classic, composed of back-to-back -back bangers in the middle of a string of equally great episodes. And today we're going to break down how exactly it keeps such a grip on the audience, even after like the 10th or 11th viewing. But before we get into the anime, let's take a look at the original story told through the manga. I'll be mostly looking at a fan translation for convenience sake, but I actually got a personal copy of the Part 3 manga from Eli over on the BBC Vlogs channel. They make some awesome stuff over there, so definitely go subscribe. Link will be in the description. Here, I have a question. Can you um, take a video with me uh, and you say, um, uh, I'm sorry about that, sir. Series creator Hirohiko Araki actually credits the Darby Brothers as defining characters for the manga, setting it apart from what else readers might be interested in. The conflict featured in this arc would also go on to inspire the dice match with Rohan in Part 4, and the whole idea of a poker match in the first place was inspired by one of Araki's previous mangas, Cool Shock BT. Chapter 98 begins with the Crusaders' arrival in Cairo. They stop for a drink and soon encounter Daniel J. Darby, a compulsive gambler and servant of the evil Dio. He's slow to approach the group, but eventually entices them with a bet to see which piece of meat a random cat will go for. Things like Darby's card tricks and visual references to the Sphinx tip the audience off to his trickery, but unfortunately, Polnareff agrees to bet his soul over essentially a coin flip. Here we get to see Darby's charisma at work, confusing and overwhelming Joseph until somebody steps in to keep the conversation rolling. It's only because of how arrogant Darby acts that Polnareff finally takes the bait, assuming that he's just messing around. And of course, the cat chooses the slice of meat that it was trained to, costing Polnareff his soul and forcing the group to take the defensive. As is usually the case with anime and manga, we get a glimpse into Darby's psyche through a monologue that he gives to Abdul. He defends his cheating, basically saying to hate the game and not the players. Gambling is the same as social relations, it's a game of fakes and cheats, the one who cries is the loser. By Chapter 99 of Stardust Crusaders, Joseph has been established as extremely intelligent, defeating Mariah and her stand Bastet just a few chapters earlier. Additionally, if you've seen Part 2 where he's the protagonist, it comes off as an even bigger test of his arsenal of tricks, as we've seen him pull off some insane maneuvers in the face of deadly threats. They once again play for a soul, this one being Joseph's, and this time around they'll be taking turns placing coins into a cup filled with water, the one overflowing the cup being the one who loses. This is where the true colors of Darby begin to show. At this point, not only has he revealed himself as the user of Osiris, but as a manipulative mastermind. It makes you think back to the beginning, when Darby waited until the very last minute to get the Crusaders to come back into the cafe, just to string the group along and make them on edge from the very start. The chapter ends with Joseph being the clear winner, not only as he kept his cool and bruised the ego of his opponent, but he cheated on his final turn, filling the glass to the absolute maximum using a cotton ball. It seems impossible to lose until Darby, who had also cheated, easily adds another coin without spilling the water, shattering Joseph's composure and taking his soul before he even has the chance to overflow the cup. For clarification, his ability is to take the souls of his opponents, and cheating and gambling are just two things that help him accomplish that task. Additionally, Osiris can take somebody's soul if they admit defeat in their hearts, even if they haven't actually lost the game, further tying into the idea that the loser is merely the one who cries. And if you look at Darby himself, he's less of a gambler and more of a cold, calculated cheater. If he truly wants to win, he can't let Joseph so easily rattle him by altering his plans and calling him the wrong name. 
And although Joseph ends up losing, Jotaro uses this gathered knowledge to poke more holes in Darby's plan. Now we get down to the poker match between Darby and Jotaro, but before we get into the details, let's take a look at what Jotaro really needs to do to seal the victory. Many look at this game as a showcase of Jotaro's insane ability to improvise and stay calm under pressure, but I think it's a little bit deeper than that. When you break it down, the game is less about bluffing and keeping it cool, and more about understanding the fundamentals of your opponent and what strategies are most effective. Right off the bat, Jotaro catches Darby attempting to cheat, breaking his finger and finding a random kid to deal the next set of hands. The first game doesn't go too well, with Jotaro losing three of his six chips, but it matters less when Darby's victory has been set up from the start. It's this sense of security that allows Darby to be so confident in his challenges, something that Jotaro is quick to take advantage of in the next round. He starts by doing the unthinkable and refusing to look at his cards, a completely outlandish maneuver which he follows up by raising the pot Avdol's soul. On the surface, it just looks like Jotaro is doing anything in his power to raise the stakes and shake up Darby, but this is only part of the puzzle. He too has meticulously planned his actions from the start, beginning with eliminating most of Darby's ways to cheat through the use of his stand, Star Platinum. Darby's greatest weakness is his arrogance, and it's worth taking note that Joseph may have won his bet if Darby didn't cheat using a piece of chocolate. Although it's impossible to completely prevent him from cheating, Jotaro still attempts to isolate the game of poker, taking the slightest bit of control out of the hands of his opponent and driving him completely crazy. Going to and refusing to look at your cards isn't just a bold flex, it's actually a great strategy to maintain your poker face. I mean, how can Jotaro know in his heart that he's lost if he doesn't even know in his head what cards he has? Darby raises the pot again, sure that forcing another soul out of Jotaro will finally break him, but remember, Jotaro doesn't need to win or lose, he just needs to stay calm and keep playing. So after forfeiting the soul of his friend Kakyoin, Jotaro lights up a cigarette and his efforts begin to pay off. Not only have his bold decisions confused Darby, but the subtle use of Star Platinum throughout the match begins to sow doubt in his mind. Jotaro isn't just mocking Darby, he's showing him how undetectable his stand ability can be, further crumbling Darby's confidence and overwhelming him with anxiety. And just when he regains his confidence and believes he's won, Jotaro raises the pot one final time, wagering his mother's soul. One thing that I haven't pointed out up until now is that the entire focus of this conflict is on the poker game. Darby even states early on that he gambles for the thrill of it, not to please some master like Dio. Not to mention, they barely use their stand abilities, with Osiris used to take souls after the match is lost, and Star Platinum being used mainly for intimidation. After Jotaro bets the souls of himself, Avdol, Kakyoin, and raises the pot his own mother, he now demands to know the secret of Dio's stand ability in return. Information of this importance forces Darby to put his own life on the line, something that he hasn't had to do up until now. It's worth noting that to regain his confidence that Jotaro wasn't switching cards, Darby denies the possibility of Star Platinum moving at such high speeds. This may indicate that he doesn't know complete details on Dio's stand, since this is something that it can accomplish, but we're just gonna leave that be for now. Either way, it brings him back to reality, and he begins hyperventilating only for Jotaro to repeat Darby's own words back to him, except instead of, Go ahead, Mr. Juster. It's, Come on, are you gonna call or fold? Say it out loud right now, Darby! And chapter 103 ends with the souls of everybody returning to their original inhabitants, or crossing over to the afterlife, it wasn't super clear. Darby is too mentally destroyed to reveal any information about Dio, and Jotaro's hand is revealed to have been shit the entire time. The resolution isn't very long, but the most intense part of the story lasts a good two chapters, it's such a satisfying victory on so many levels, from the intensity of the poker match, to the stakes, to the subtle losses and victories over the course of the conflict. Reading and researching the manga for this video was a real treat, and I do have to say, I did feel a lot of the same excitement reading it as I did watching it. But man, nothing can live up to the experience of watching this for the first time with no context. The anime adaptation is split evenly into two 22-minute episodes, with the first covering the bets with Polnareff and Joseph, and the second covering the poker game with Jotaro. The anime really does a great job bringing this story to life. It also depicts more of the environment, like the coffee shop and the surrounding pyramids, even including the lone panel of the Sphinx to further symbolize Darby's pursuit. If you watch this episode for the first time, even if you've seen every single episode up until that one, the first thing that's definitely going to jump out at you is the giant black blob stuck to Jotaro's face. Well, the perceptive amongst you might notice that Jotaro is smoking a cigarette, so we can show animal abuse, people exploding, a literal naked child running around with a fetus, but if a 17-year-old smokes, the Japanese government will knock down your door and serve you a black rectangle. Not the gun kind of black rectangle, the kind of rectangle. 
What makes this even more confusing is that there are clips of the uncensored version all over YouTube, so it must be out there somewhere, just not on Crunchyroll or Netflix. Other than that, the first major difference I found between the anime and the manga is, in the anime there's a little more to flesh out Darby's powers and his backstory. After he steals Polnareff's soul, he reveals his collector's book filled with other victims, one of which being Stephen Moore. The anime actually shows us the circumstances of the night Darby stole Stephen Moore's soul, showing the bar and even the man himself, as opposed to a brief mention and just a look at his face in the original comics. These episodes are also full of your classic serving of uh, JoJo characters randomly speaking English. If you're watching the original anime with English subtitles, it makes for a good laugh since it can sometimes take itself too seriously. The dub is just as good for this part though, you'll just miss some of the standout lines. I mean, it's obvious why it sounds funny, Japanese voice actors aren't really trained for English lines, but you can actually break down the phonetics and find links between both languages. I've looked for like an hour and I can't find this thread, but I saw someone online talking about how Darby's voice actor probably looked at the Japanese phonetics of words like gangster to figure out how to pronounce Joestar. And since we didn't talk about it much before, let's look at how the anime handled the fight between Joseph and Darby. As previously mentioned, and if you've seen this before you'll know, Darby defeats Joseph by cheating. This is not only foreshadowed once, but twice, as we see Darby offer a piece of chocolate before the match, and have a bit himself before his final turn. This is something so minor that I didn't pick up on it until I was making this video and literally looking at the manga and anime side by side, just jumping around. It's the kind of thing that makes me really excited and motivated and appreciative of the work, but it kind of intimidates me because how could I ever create something so amazing? I know personally, I had such a high level of confidence in Joseph the first time I watched this, just because his plan seemed so well thought out, and it wasn't implausible that Darby might lose his second game. Joseph always seems to have tricks up his sleeve, and fans of Part 2 will have seen this firsthand during his fights with the Pillar Men. Although Darby ends up winning, the reveal of his plan is even more mind-boggling than something Joseph could have pulled off. We don't learn how he won until later, and a trick so convoluted can only come from the mind of someone like Hirohiko Araki. <laughs> <laughs> Jotaro realizes that Darby used a piece of chocolate to tilt the glass. When Joseph thought he had won, Darby moved his shadow, causing the chocolate to melt and leave room for another coin. It's really this kind of stuff that makes the series so appealing to me. I just love when characters get into a situation that they can't get out of. It tickles like the analytical part of my brain, and sometimes I'll even pause the episode to try and guess and see what happens. It also tells me that Araki isn't afraid to commit to something that might take a lot of time to figure out, and that he understands that taking shortcuts won't leave as big of an impact on his audience. And like gambling, losing isn't determined by the cards you play, or even the cards you've been dealt. It only happens when you lose your spirit and decide to give up. The only other difference I found in the anime versus the manga is that Jotaro's victory is just a little bit different. In the manga, it isn't super clear that Jotaro won until after he asks for Dio's secret, specifically the page showing Darby breaking down when attempting to call. In the anime, however, when Jotaro bets his mother's soul, the playing of his theme in the background basically guarantees that he won. I mean, imagine if it were Jorno's theme instead, it would be completely inarguable. We also get to see way more illustrations of Darby. The manga has quite a few, and this one is my favorite, appearing in both the book and the show. It reminds me of that one uh, screenshot of Link from Twilight Princess. Uh, you guys probably know the one. It really is fascinating breaking this stuff apart, and although I'm a little discouraged at the prospect of creating something so masterful, it's worth it for the thrill alone. I'm sure half the stuff I talked about today wasn't completely intentional, but that's just a hallmark of good writing. Knowing and recognizing what you can improve will just bring everything else together. Like, I doubt Araki wrote out detailed plans for every individual character, but it can easily be inferred when everyone is just so deep and every panel needs to mean something. Hmm. Actually, no, I was just going to end the video there, but you did remind me of one final thing that they added to the anime. <laughs> Next time on Luke Wilson TV.